So you work at a place called Snow Lab, I believe. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, can you tell us a, a little bit like that? Sounds very interesting. Sounds very uh, Half Life and uh, yeah, Gordon Freeman. <laughs> you, you just I describe it I, actually for for everybody, and it's something. It's a joke which I've said so many times, and most mm. people are just like, "What?" But I'll say it again. The reason why, the reason why everything went wrong that day at uh, at the Black Mesa facility, okay. is because Gordon Freeman is is a uh, theoretical physicist. Yeah. Uh, if he was an experimental physicist, things would not have gone wrong. <laughs> he should, should have had the sack on the spot, mate. He, he, he should not have actually been anywhere near that lab. <laughs> I have, I have never seen a theoretical physicist anywhere near any equipment. <laughs> yeah. I've, but anyway, jokes aside. I've, I think so, they, um, uh, they must have just shown him some cake and said, just, just pop in there. Have some cake. Yeah. I mean, it, so, um, yeah, so I mean, a little bit of background really is that um, I, you know, links back to video games again. It's like when I when I was in school, um, getting towards the time where I'm thinking about whether I want to go to university or not, or if that's an option for me. Um, I knew my favorite subjects at the time were uh, maths, physics, and chemistry. Yeah, and at the time when it was getting closer, I knew that I. Would was not so hot with chemistry but physics and maths were great and if i had to choose the two i'd go physics and so yeah I, I did um physics with astronomy and again that's where the elite comes in because i'm just like i could go and fly around the stars um so yeah so i was really more into the astronomy uh side of things anyway uh long story short is i um i did a project in my final year uh physics um, which was like hands-on hardware, building some equipment. And um, yeah, I made, uh, we made a uh, uh, cosmic ray telescope um, using some like salvaged uh, detector equipment. Um, and I thought that was awesome. Yeah. And um, the person who supervised me was like, oh, hey, do you, do you, uh, do you ever consider doing a PhD? And I was like, oh, no, I don't think I'm, uh, I don't think I'm actually good enough. Uh, and again, it was one of those things where everybody I knew who like your peers and you look up to your peers. Yeah. And again, this goes back to me being very working class is mm. that most people had it, had their lives kind of like together. Me, my life wasn't not as if it was a mess. No, no, it was just, it was just that I had to work so hard just to keep up with everybody else. That's how I felt. Okay. And so, and so when it, when it came to this whole thing of possibly doing a PhD, Everybody else had already got their positions. Everybody else had already already got their placements, basically. And, and I didn't even consider it because all of the people who were doing PhD, I thought, were so much smarter than I was. And then it was my, my, my person who then, then became my supervisor sort of took a chance because he was like, hey, this kid just did this hardware project and he barely, did any, barely required any supervision. And that was pretty impressive. And so, yeah, it kind of took a chance on me. And we got, I got a position... Uh, in experimental particle physics, which sounds like awesome. oh, sounds awesome. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, uh, yeah. So, so you know, roll on, um, roll on a few years. I, when I got my PhD, um, I moved to Canada um, largely because uh, my fiance at the time, um, now wife, um, I sort of wanted to follow follow her and uh, there was a position available at the same university now we didn't tell anybody that we were <laughs> that we were engaged or whatever yeah. we just i just applied for it and yeah. i got it and at that point it was like surprise um but basically yeah uh, i worked on a dark matter experiment um called uh, deep 3600 which is actually still there it's uh, it's still at snow lab um and um Basically, yeah, um, this is a deep underground uh, clean lab. Um, it's called Snow Lab because it's it's based out of a previous experiment, which was the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. Uh, I don't going to get too technical, but basically, this was an experiment which um, ultimately solved like a really big problem in physics. I know that sounds like, oh, who cares about big problems in physics, but the thing is about physics is that it's not that we want to know everything. I mean, well, that's not true. We do. We totally want to know everything. Yeah. <laughs> but what it is is that 
you want to be able to have a model and that model has to be able to predict certain things and it has to also fit with observables um so you can't just make a model to be like oh hey i've got this model it fixes this problem over here uh, ignore all this junk over here, there it's like no 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 you have to make models which which fit everything oh, gotcha. fit all the observ uh, yeah. fit all the observables which you can reasonably predict yeah. and make predictions and so there was there was basically this whole prediction of like how the sun works um when when physicists started to be able the technology became um available to be able to test some of these uh, models they of course did <laughs> and the observables were completely different to what the theory prediction was and of course everybody's like oh my god why um so is this but, yeah, like long... fusion reactor type stuff this is yeah so so the original problem uh was uh, called the solar solar neutrino problem and so what it is is that um nuclear physicists at the time uh, this is this is like uh 60s 70s if i get my time scales correctly uh done correctly um you know we'd proven that neutrinos exist and i mean uh, this is this gets very technical but basically um um during reactions you get particles coming out um so smash two hydrogen together creates uh uh, well, it creates a larger, <laughs> larger particle, and it also uh, releases energy. Um, but then, as this pro, as this, um, as this process uh, goes on, um, until you get hydrogen, um, it produces different different particles. Um, it produces like electrons, gammas, um, uh, neutrinos. Uh, for people who need to look those up, that's fine. Um, it's very niche. Um, but the neutrinos are the only thing which are produced in the core directly, which don't really interact with much material. So you can get neutrinos which go get produced in the core of the sun and they will pass out of the sun and come, um, well, just travel until they stop. Um, now, they're, they're so weakly interacting that that's possible, right? And and so what, what you do is you, you, you make an experiment and you literally just do this run the statistics you make an experiment large enough that you might be able to get one or two interactions from particles from the sun a day and you just run that experiment and watch it <laughs> um and um so yeah the, what what this what the sudbury uh, neutrino observatory did was to build an experiment which had a very slightly uh, had a very special detector medium which was heavy water um and and you know the long story short is this just allowed them to probe a specific interaction um type with neutrinos which the other experiments haven't hadn't been able to do um and so it gives you like two points of reference you've got the normal interactions which happen with a normal all that sort of stuff and then you've got this special interaction which which only happens with heavy water and it then allows you to compare and that solved everything because we were, they were able to prove that um, this. What? What? what, what <laughs> I just uh, explained everything without even telling what the problem was. The problem <laughs> was <laughs> I have to edit this and go back. Uh, the problem was that when they observed neutrinos coming from the sun, they saw less. Um, they saw like about half of what you should get according to theory. And. Uh, the, the the one of the models which um was around was that these neutrinos can uh, spontaneously um uh change flavor and again it's get this is getting a little bit very much too too detailed but basically when they change flavor there's free flavors and you can't actually do much detection um with two of the flavors um in fact, if that's the simplest way I can put it. Okay. And so what, what it is, is that um, most of the other detectors were, were uh, seeing this one type of interaction, which occurs for all types, but predominantly this one type. Whereas the SNOW experiment, or the Sud Sudbury Neutrino Experiment, um, uh, Observatory, sorry, uh, they got all of those three types, plus one which is specific to one of the flavors. And so that that allows you to be like, oh well, if I if my total signal is this, but this one specific type is this, it's just like you can use it as a cross calibration, and it and then that tells you, yeah, what the total actually is. 
and they solved the sort of neutrino problem and got the Nobel Prize for it and everything. Um, yeah, and um, so moving forward, they extended this lab underground. So it's basically a lab space which is uh, about two miles underground um, in a active nickel mine in wow. Sudbury. <laughs> so, so you so, spend most of your working hours underground well uh, i spend most of my working hours right now working from home but um yeah. but but i do do sh i do do shifts underground yeah. yeah and and so yeah you you have to go over early in the morning like five five o'clock in the morning and uh put all your mining gear on and and um uh go down in the cage which is like express elevator down <laughs> wow. so, so how, deep, um, how deep is this is this hole? <laughs> oh, they so um, the deepest you can reach with the cage, I think, is around seventy-six thousand feet. Wow. Uh, sorry, seven six hundred. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> seven thousand six hundred um, feet. Uh, we get off at sixty-eight um, hundred. Um, yeah, we get off at sixty-eight hundred and oh. walk, and uh, the mining. Uh, activities I think are down at nine thousand, ten thousand these days, but they don't. They they, have, they basically go down, get off at sixty eight, and then they have to drive down. So what's the reason for it? What's the reason um, for being underground? Is it because, oh yeah. Is it because the experiments are dead dodgy? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you see some of the electronics that I have seen, yes, dodgy as no. Um... <laughs> No, it, it's um, it's backgrounds. Um, basically, um, the um, the deeper you go underground, uh, the more you are shielded from cosmic rays. Actually, so so what it is is that the universe um, at large is very good at making uh, very high energy uh, particles. So um, you get like supernova rem remnants. Um, uh, high mass compact objects like uh, white dwarfs and neutron, uh, neutron stars etc and they they actually act as like natural accelerators and so you end up with these protons uh so like hydrogen single particles mostly um which are coming at us with energies like far in excess of anything we can produce on the earth and they just hit the upper atmosphere <laughs> and then they just send the spray of of particles through uh, through the atmosphere. So this is happening now, while we're on the surface. Obviously. Oh, this is happening all the time. Yeah, yeah, this is happening all yeah, the time. Okay. Um, and so, one of the one of the particles. So this is the whole thing I said upset about neutrino flavors is that um, you know if everybody thinks back to their high school physics, uh, you have like uh, protons, neutrons, electrons. So they they are like um, so you have protons, neutrons, electrons, and electron neutrinos. This is like the first generation of particles. Then there's a, another generation higher up in mass, which is almost like an equivalent, but it's like a higher mass version of everything else. And so what the problem is, <laughs> the problem is, is that um, the higher mass version of the electron, the muon, um, it, because it's, because it, again, it's this generational uh, thing, its interaction um, strength with most material is very low. And so you get this high energy uh, uh, relativistic particle, basically uh, some particles is traveling very close to the speed of light, which just passes like through the earth. <laughs> and so, and so if you're on surface running one of these experiments, um, I think it's like basically for a, for a square meter um, of uh, area, you basically get one muon per second. Uh, passing through and so you can't run experiments where the dead time is dictated by these bloody muons passing through the experiment every you basically but this data any day any muons pass through you see uh and you can't use the data because it's garbage uh it's not what you're looking for so the only way that you can get away from that is to go underground or into a mountain and so yeah you basically get these muons which are all filtered out by the rock uh, above Gotcha. Um, gotcha. Yeah, it's a, I, know, I know that's a very, very long answer, but but it is it's to just, shield. Yeah, I was just going to say, so it just acts as a natural shield. Yeah, um, yeah. And then there's and then there's other things you can do with the experiments to shield them more. Um, 
because the problem is even though you shield the, the even <laughs> even though you shield the um muons the muons still interact with the rock and they still produce other stuff and the other stuff you can you they have to get you have to shield against as well but that's that's detector design that's that's where you design per, parts of your detector in a certain way yeah <laughs> it's um yeah, it's fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's labs like it around the world, though. Uh, there's a few different places which have got a similar thing. Um, in the UK, there's um, um, a potash mine in Bulby, which have got a lab. Oh, uh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So shout out to Sean Palin, who is the director there, who uh, who's cool. It's a cool guy. Um, yeah, and... Hi, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I said hi, Sean. <laughs> hi, Sean. Yeah, um... Yeah, no, and uh, yes, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of labs around the world which have got the same sort of thing. Uh, there's one in, in Italy as well, Grand Sasso. People might remember it from the faster than light neutrinos uh, scandal thing which happened. That was at Grand Sasso, <laughs> which was caused by a loose cable. <clears throat> wow, what a loose cable. So, so we yeah. tri somebody tripped <laughs> over the plug. Was... Yeah, it was literally like a GPS, like a GPS sig signal which was not plugged in correctly, and so it got this weird reflection which made it look like, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the version of the story I got told, but yeah, apparently it's loose. It was loose connection. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so I'm. Um, so what's your what's your position, your job? Yeah, so so I'm. I mean, so I'm an experimental particle physicist. So I I do lots of hands-on stuff. Um, I do do a bit of programming and, and simulation and stuff, but but it's very 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 rare that I do that these days. I haven't done any real simulations and things for a few years. Oh. Um, I try and do analysis when I can, but my, my main position, actually, my actual job title is a uh, detector manager. So I'm the detector manager of, uh, currently anyway, um, this video might not date well, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> but um, um, I'm detector manager of uh, the Snow Plus experiment, which is basically the successor to Snow. Uh, we're looking at different physics, um, but it's basically my job to maintain the detector and produce high quality physics data. So yeah, the we're basically running uh, what is nineteen nineties, late nineties uh, electronics still. Uh, wow! Keeping this keeping this stuff alive is wow. still, really cool. Still running Windows ninety eight. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, you know, we're all on Linux. Yeah, it's all on Linux. But 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 it's 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 really interesting. Again, going back to like this kind of um, hands on style of electronics is is like. Um, when, you know, when you, when you, um, uh, talk to like some of the other guests, like about, you know, their involvement and like talk about, you know, how all the machines work and they work in a certain way and the certain tricks you can do. Uh, what's interesting with, with this and electronics is that, yeah, it, it's kind of cool. I think we've got to this point where so many detectors these days um run on fpgas basically you know they run on this black box where as you as a scientist you don't really know what's going on if something breaks it just breaks and and that's you just have to get a new piece of equipment with with this uh with this electronic switch which, which we use it's like um there is like one custom chip on it there's there's one custom chip which was made at university of penn and the rest of it is like off the shelf um electronics and so there's so many of these problems which we've got with the got with our electronics where you can actually be like scratch your head okay this thing is happening what is broken on the board which can possibly cause this <laughs> and then it's like going onto your board and like desoldering a bunch of surface mount stuff and resoldering uh chips on and fixing stuff so cool <laughs> yeah certainly sounds yeah. it certainly sounds it yeah yeah but it's um yeah, we're running. It's a running experiment. Um, we are taking physics data these days. Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of the. I'm not sure exactly how many physics experiments are currently running at Snow Lab, but it's but it's it's one of the big ones. Um, got a huge detector. It's like a 12 meter uh, acrylic sphere filled with um, a material which is very similar to mineral oil, um, but it produces light when particles pass through it. Um, and uh, right now we're basically looking at solar data and uh, geo geophysics data and uh, in the future we will load it with a material uh, tellurium uh, tellurium uh, yeah everybody knows of uh, tellurium which is in the capacitors and things um, but no that's tantalum 
What do we use Tellurium for? Anyway, whatever. <laughs> you can see my brain doesn't work very well sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we, we're filling it with Tellurium because, again, to go into the very, very fine details, um, Tellurium performs this physics process, which which um, can occur in two different ways. We know one of the ways, uh, but this other way, uh, best way I can put it, <laughs> long story short, this other way is if it, if it occurs, um, it will tell us something, yeah, quite uh, profound and and uh, about the universe and specifically the creation of the universe. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So yeah, yeah. So 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 like basically big, big also, bang type thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it all stems from the fact that well, at least as particle physics models go, when you produce um, matter from energy, um, so I don't know, condensed matter from energy. Um, you have to produce equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Um, and there are ways in which you can get more matter than antimatter, but the ways in which we know of uh, currently from high energy physics experiments don't give you enough to get what we observe in the, uh, in the universe today. Um, and so that's where neutrino physics comes in. That's where neutrino physics is the exciting part because... Uh, the neutrino sector is is one area where, yeah, if we can prove that this particular rare event uh, exists, it tells us um, it tells us something quite fundamental about um, matter and antimatter in the neutrino sector, and it allows for mechanisms by which we can totally produce everything which we see today. Um, it's just that this, <laughs> it's just wow. that this event type is incredibly rare. Um, okay. so it's, that's why most of these experiments are underground to shield backgrounds. They're designed in very specific ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 To stop the, uh, resident cascade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to push this to 110%. It's a bit of a gamble, <laughs> but we need the resolution. <laughs> oh, right. It's, uh, <laughs> it's been fantastic talking to you. Um, uh, no, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, it's, th th um, thanks for doing this. It's uh, been brilliant. It really has. Yeah, yeah it, it's 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 funny because um, yeah, I always I can always get, go on these like random rambles of trails of <laughs> talking about stuff, and it's like, yeah, I mean, like uh, the physics side of things. Um, I think, I mean, just as a little final thing, I think, I think the I think physicists have this, uh, scientists have this kind of weird thing where. Not many people have actually met an actual scientist, and and I don't I don't mean to disrespect uh, you know my peers which work in different fields like uh, biology and things, oh. but like but when it comes to things like physics, um, everybody's nobody knows what that looks like, no. and and so my joke is always my joke is similar to the to the um, Gordon Freeman thing at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like a theoretical physicist typically spends most of their time in front of a computer. Uh, it's just the truth. It, it, it is just the truth. They don't wear lab coats. They'll wear shirts and t-shirts or whatever, and we'll sit at a desk and they'll mostly crunch numbers. It's what a theoretical physicist does. Um, whereas experimental physicist is more closer to an engineer. Uh, that's what you kind of look like to next to to the outside. And also, like in movies and things, um, yeah, everybody's got this idea that we all walk around with like you know lab coats and checkboards, right? And we're, we're all like. Oh, doctor, you know, such and such. Uh, this thing is wrong with this thing. No, no. Nobody, nobody ever refers to me as doctor. And if they did, I would probably tell them not to. Um, the only time it ever happens is when you've got somebody who's trying to impress upon a student that they're not talking to another student. Uh, yeah, I've got you. <laughs> it's like, it's like, watch your tone, young man <laughs> or young young, young lady. <laughs> You're speaking to somebody who's got years of experience. <laughs> yeah, that's just that's um, just a re that's just a respect thing, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it and so, yeah, and so that's just it's just like I say, it's one of those things. In many ways, it's like a bit of a curse. You know, we might people might also say, well, you're a scientist, uh, you must find most sci-fi incredibly annoying. And it's like, well, not really. Like, I I can turn off for about an hour before I start to get annoyed. But <laughs> well, but that, you know. As, but, as long as ultimately... you know it's it's science fiction, then <laughs> yeah, why not? yeah. But but I mean I mean ultimately it's yeah ultimately it's 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 
it's kind of it's kind of cool so in the, that the thing is 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 exactly that with being a scientist um i don't think you ever really turn off that's the problem and it's it's also it's good i mean it, i i i enjoy looking at the world through this weird vision of, of what's going on um but it, you don't really turn off if that makes any sense so it's like yeah rather than just movies... accepting your your thinking yeah boy and why is that why is that doing that how's that working yeah, yeah. I, I get what you mean yeah yeah. One of one of the problems is is that I mean again a lot of engineers and lots of people tinkerers I mean like such as yourself yeah. you also don't think you can't fix things <laughs> which is also a problem yeah. <laughs> because yeah. sometimes I can't fix things and then you have, but yeah and the, then you have a go don't you and he's like oh, yeah then you have a go and that. it breaks worse you know. <laughs> <laughs> 